Okay. Is it rolling? It's rolling. Okay. Welcome to Tiny Talks. We are Tiny in Seattle, and I am Janet Cole, and this is my husband, Gary Cole. Hello. We're here to tell you all about uh, our new project that we're going to be doing yes. called Tiny in Seattle, and Tiny. we are very excited. Very. <laughs> um, why did we go tiny? We did it. What's your opinion? I thought you were going to go with this. I am. I'm on it. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just recovering from that. Okay. Uh, we went tiny because uh, Janet's always wanted to live in under a thousand square feet. I had to, um, and we couldn't do that with our other partners, our other other parent, other husbands and wives because it just wouldn't work out. You know, you gotta absolutely appreciate the person that you live with. Yes, <laughs> appreciate them, love them, get along with them explicitly. And have great, a great friendship. Right. And if, if you're gonna be tiny, if you're gonna live under 500 square feet like we do, uh, well, right now we're 517, we're doing the best we can. Um, we live under 500 square feet. In order to do that, you have to actually appreciate the person that you're with. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And. Uh, we have been living tiny since 2013. Uh, we traveled to Mexico. We had a good time. We traveled to the East Coast. We had a good time. Yeah. We spent a lot of time updating the websites yes. and getting things done. And now we're trying a new project uh, and we're gonna do uh, live broadcasts whenever possible. From Seattle, Washington. <laughs> and we absolutely love it here. We love it here. Um, Okay, tell me about Cruise Bruce. When did you, why did you start Cruise Bruce? When did you start Cruise Bruce? What, whatever you want to tell me about it. I started Cruise Bruce in uh, December 2005. It had 23 pages and they were all people that had mysteriously gone missing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where, that was the base of, of the site was just those 23 pages. And then we expanded the site to include uh, everything that happens at sea, ports, it became a really big site and the front page had my uh, love child weather on the main page and live cruise ship tracker and uh, we broke it all up into niche sites based on uh, what people asked for what they were looking for what traffic they were doing what what patterns they were doing yes. what they needed where they wanted to click through and we quickly discovered we had loyal visitors that came all the time uh, from the Caribbean, people who watched our, our weather because uh, it, it was impacted the, them. Right. And we had a good, we were a good source for it. It was a pretty good layout. Yes. So uh, weather was the first site that we broke out of Cruise Brews and, and made it full blown about weather. And uh, from there it just evolved. It evolved, it's expanded out into niche sites. Uh, like fires, and missings, and sinking, and ports, ports, and deaths, and all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah. Um, and uh, you had it all built up pretty good when I first met you right. in 2013. And uh, when I first met you in 2013, you said you wanted to travel to refresh content on the websites. Right. So we went to Mexico, we had a great time, we did the Myrtle Beach, we had a great time there. Uh, we expanded the websites into uh, by region for the uh, cruise ship ports, and that's why we were traveling. Yes. And uh, we expanded the tracker network to include Mexico, the, Car the Caribbean, the baby trackers, the baby trackers for Alaska, and everything that we had to do. Um, and that was pr primarily for people that when you when you had the live tracker, that was from the world and. And with a slower connection, trying to drill down to specific, specific area that you wanted to get to was kind of tedious and right. uh, troublesome. And so. the mobile devices didn't do it very well. No. So we had to adjust the pages to fit mobile devices better. Right. And uh, that's why we another reason why we broke out on more trucker pages because it would make it very easier for people to actually see their region. So one one of the most popular trackers during hurricane season is the Gulf of Mexico because it really shows all the ships in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, without everything else uh, trying to load on the page on a small device that was really, really handy. Right. Um, after we got the expansion of the trackers, 
then we decided we needed to expand the webcams and uh, other things that went uh, like the webcams and the uh, uh, the webcams and uh, schedules and stuff came out of that right uh, because we started noticing that more people were asking for more of that content um, plus we had to do the, the schedules because literally you couldn't find any information on such and such a cruise ship right when you had to report it was very difficult so if we had our own uh, websites that we could source for the schedules schedules that would be perfect uh, all that good stuff so now we can see where the ships are at at any one time where they were on any one day and where they'll be tomorrow right as often as possible <clears throat> we like to be able to say when I write an article I like to be able to say that the ship originated here it called at this port this port this port this port before returning and this is where it was at the time this incident took place so we have that reference and, and mix the story we can do the five W's plus uh, who what when where why yes. and sometimes how and sometimes how because uh, that's the meat and the potatoes of, of, of every article to answer the five W's if you could do that then you don't feel like you got burned by clickbait right like a lot of our competitors right um, or other websites on the internet we all know about that right. we spend a lot of time digging through stuff trying to say why can't we find the information right and that's kind of how uh, everything expanded so much because like deaths we never planned on having she never really planned on having a site about deaths it's just that because there was no information there was no resource to go collect the data uh, tracking the death on the cruise ship she had to do it herself right and honestly we built every site for ourselves as a resource for ourselves uh, that we could reference in an article and uh, because the references just weren't out there there was nobody reliable to reference a lot of the uh, five w's right exactly and and deaths is the most shining example of that um literally she wouldn't have done that it was it was a completely by accident um, she just wanted one place to store everything so that she could quickly look through and say Okay, yes, in 2019, this is how many people we had. In 2018, this is how many people we had. And uh, these are how many suicides there were. This is how many overboards there were. Right. No, the overboards are not always suicide. accidents. And not always accidents. They're much more likely to be suicide right. than they are to be accidental. Uh, accidental is rare. I think we've got maybe two actually accidentals two or three accidental overboards well it's just not me uh, I can think of one accidental overboard right. right off the top of my head tell me that was the gay couple who were on their honeymoon at Halloween That's true. he really didn't uh, you murdered him you murdered him that was the uh, line from the screen yes you murdered him but he didn't intend to go overboard no he intended to land on top of the lifeboat. And That's what we believe. That just didn't quite work out for him. Right. Um, so it does happen. It does happen. But. Um, and then there was. And the, that was still an intentional overboard. So technically, it was an intentional overboard. Right. It wasn't an unintentional. Okay. Well, I can give you a better one then. Yeah. The one who went overboard. They were standing up watching the sunrise. There you go. When the radar the went radar off, they off. were coming into port, and they weren't counting on that. It knocked them off. Boom, he was done. Right. Exactly. There are some accidents. Right. Usually, it's done because, and that's what we call suicidal behavior. Because they were doing something that was, you shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Standing up on top of the radar in a controlled part of the ship that is literally do not pass. That's why there was a you sign shall that not pass. do not pass. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no entry beyond this point. But a bunch of college kids thought they they knew more. They did. Sadly. It didn't work out. No. Uh, and that's literally the type of thing that Janet spends most of her time doing is researching who, what, when, where, and why, and how, sometimes how, how this happened. Right. Uh, so, now that we've got uh, a good description of cruise ship wave yes um, and where we were where we were uh, 
let's talk a little bit about what, how we got to Seattle and how we got to Tiny in Seattle. Right. Uh, we took our trip from Arkansas. Right. Uh, because I was working in corporate America. She asked me if I wanted to travel with her. And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> That's not the honey. Yeah, yeah. She said, she said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to leave Arkansas. We're going to go to the beach. Right. We're going to go to Mexico. We're going to live on the beach. We're going to retire. If, if it works out, we're going to retire in Mexico or somewhere in the area. Right. And uh, I was like, let me see. Yeah. <laughs> so we drove to Mexico from Arkansas. You want me to tell the story? Mr. Toad's wild ride. <laughs> it was. It was. You want me to tell the story? Go ahead. Okay. It's we, yours. we drove from Arkansas. Uh, we literally sold everything we owned. We sold our houses. She sold her stuff. She had a massive amount of yard sales. I had a massive amount of yard sales. A dozen, for sure. At least. It was, it was very... It was uh, surprisingly gratifying. Yes, because we were able to purge ourselves of all the baggage that we had. We had an abundant amount of stuff that we really didn't need. And we got it all into one SUV. What, right. what kind of SUV was that? It was an Expedition. It's a Ford Expedition. Right. And uh, we, filled, we filled the Expedition up with everything we owned, and it was packed. It was packed. Uh, we overpacked it. Right. Uh, and because we thought we were literally going to retire in Mexico. We didn't know that things were going to work out the way they did, right. but we were flexible. We were open to whatever happened. Whatever happened. And Which did, included being robbed by the police in Mexico. We had a good time. We, we, we took off. Uh, even though we saw that uh, the State Department had issued warnings, we ignored the warnings and continued. <laughs> right. We, we, we took our... Uh, we both had spent a lot of time in Mexico and stuff, and we didn't think that it was going to be a big deal. No. Turned out we were wrong. Uh, right. the, the journey was much more dangerous, and it had gotten much more dangerous. Yes. And it's still too dangerous today in a lot of areas. Yes. Uh, uh, that was the reason the we road. left after a year, because right. it, it got too dangerous. It just got too dangerous. We, spent, we, we took off from Arkansas. We drove through uh, the United States. We took the Brownville exit. Uh, into Mexico, or the Brownsville, Brownsville entrance into Mexico. Right. We drove from Brownsville all the way through until we got to Cancun. Right. Uh, along the Gulf of Mexico. Along the Gulf of Mexico. And the Caribbean Sea. Right. Um, we, we stopped at our first safe zone, which was really hard to get to, because um, we thought that we planned it out really well. We planned our trip. We didn't take into consideration topas. We planned it. When we crossed the border, they told us, do not drive at night. Do not stop unless it's the police. Do not stop for other people because they're bringing robberies on, on the road. A lot of robberies. So uh, we... Uh, we ran. We planned our schedule so that we could be off the road by dark, which right. we were going to do anyways before we heard of the mornings. Right. Um, just so we could relax and, and have supper and, and prepare for the next day. Right. But because of the topas... The topas. The topas are these uh, speed bumps. They're Mexico speed bumps, and uh, they are um, hard to get over. And they put them close together. Uh, you'll have one. You go 100 feet. You'll have another one. 100 feet. You'll have another one. And then you'll go 100 yards. You have another one. Uh, whatever. It was just really, really tough, and it slowed us down. It took us about five hours longer. Five to six hours, five to seven hours longer than we expected right. because of those. Um, so that put us way behind schedule, and we did have to drive at night. We got robbed at one time by the police. Yes, um, and that was just before dark. It was just, right. just starting to get dark, and all of a sudden the lights went on. Yep, and off we had to pull over. Uh, and I got to tell you, it wasn't as bad as we would have expected. They were laughing and smiling <laughs> the whole time. They were very polite about it when they were robbing us. But we had planned yes, ahead yeah. of time. So what we did is I had a $20 bill in my wallet. We had a stack of uh, 
U.S. bills right. that big, and there was a place where we could lift up uh, cup holders and things in our console, and we took and put that underneath and put the cup co co holders back in there, right. and then we took and stashed them somewhere else. So we stashed money here, we stashed money there. Yeah, we always had a little bit here and a little bit there. That way we could, we knew how much we had in each pocket. We knew how much we had here and there. Right. So if we were robbed, we were ready. And yeah. it worked out really good for us. That's what we were told to do by some of our friends. Right. And it worked really, really well. Yeah. Um, so that's what we did. We uh, we we got pulled over. They said, hey, we need money for Coke. Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola and uh, beer. Coca-Cola and beer. Coca-Cola and, and, and beer. And, and, and tacos or something. Okay. You know? But I was like, okay, whatever. No problem. He says to me, Janet, do you have any money? And I said, I don't know. Let me look at my purse. Yeah. Here it is. Wallet. Oh. I Here's only the have $20. $20. Uh, uh, it worked out real well. Yeah. We had a good time with it. We moved on. Yeah. Uh, we ran and ran and ran. We got through. Uh, we did our, our trips. We, we get through it. We, we finally landed in uh, River, the Mayan Palace, Riviera Maya. We stayed there for a few weeks. Five we, weeks we vacationed we at vacationed. the Riviera Maya uh, time show that Gary on. Right. And it was the last time I've stayed in that resort. And it's probably the last time we ever will. Yeah, we will. It just, it just, you know. No more. No more. Uh, but. But it was fabulous. It really was, and it gave us time to find our more permanent place to live. Right. We stayed in Puerto Aventuras, Puerto Puerto Aventuras, something like that. Yes. Um, <laughs> but we stayed there, and we were there for a year and a half, uh, roughly, and uh, we absolutely adored it. Uh, we we were able to do all the, the work we needed to do in the cruise ship ports in Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean. And uh, we worked from there to get all that stuff done. We never got to go on a cruise. Um, we made some friends. But we made a lot of friends. Some lifetime friends. We spent a lot of time on the beach. Mary, Bernie. Mary and Bernie. And, and some uh, other people there in Puerto Rico. The guy Price. who owned the, uh, what was his name? Uh, Peter. Peter, who owned. owns the, owned the uh, Latitude 20. Latitude 20. I had a 220 bar there. Wonderful, wonderful people. We had a good time. We learned a lot. Yes. We got a lot done. And uh, it gave us a little bit of perspective of some of the stuff that's going on in uh, the southern part of North America right now. All the way down, um, people are struggling. People are um, suffering. The drug wards, the cartel. They have taken over section, entire sections of the beach, um, and resorts in the area are just not as safe as they used to be. Right. Uh, people are fleeing the area, and it's no surprise there's a caravan of people coming to the United States from one time or another. Uh, I thoroughly expect that's going to continue because people are suffering. Yeah. They just aren't. Um, anyhow, we things got a little too hot for us in Mexico, yes. and we decided it was time to to get out. Uh, there were some people uh, that had been uh, kidnapped and literally were never seen again. And there were texts and there were texts even out of our resort. It was a big deal. Uh, it seemed like there was a lot of texts being snatched yeah. to help the cartel build their computer networks and their infrastructure and stuff like that. Right. And we just didn't want to be involved in it. We took off. Yeah. Um, so Gary says, uh, where do you want to go? And I said, well, let's go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And he said, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And I said, yeah, because uh, I wintered there uh, one year and it's really cheap. We can find a place, if this is the prime time, September through is your low season. And this is the prime time for us to find something cheap and it will give us time during the off season where we can try to find something annual uh, with a better rate. Right. And maybe eventually buy here. So uh, that's what we did. Right. So we picked up everything that we had, and because we had been living tiny in Mexico, uh, it was really easy. Yeah. Everything we owned, and that's that's the other thing about living tiny. Everything you own can fit in a couple suitcases, a couple carry-ons, and that's why it was so per perfect when we left Mexico. We'd been in under it was like two hundred ten or something. It, was, it wasn't very much. Yeah. It wasn't it was really really small. Um, uh, I think it was around. 210 square feet or 280, it wasn't very much. Somewhere. Um, but uh, we picked up everything we owned and we took off to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. 
where we said uh, right there downtown for the first uh, couple months or so until we found a, uh, annual. a, a more annual lease that we could get uh, closer uh, in, a, in a place where we could afford because we are going to be doing a lot of traveling and we had to go cheap. Uh, so we found a, a, a little condo that had included all the utilities, internet, the works, right on the beach, 16 floors up with a fabulous ocean view and uh, You could literally balcony. flip something off the sand, yeah. off the balcony, into the sand below. That's how yeah. close we were to the beach. It was so amazing. It's Myrtle Beach Resort. It was a great place to live. And it cost us six hundred dollars a month with everything included. Yeah, it, it was a it was, it was it was wonderful. It yeah. really was amazing. Um, we had a good deal. We had a good landlady. She has a couple condos there. She did a really good deal for us. Yeah. And even though we left early, um, three years to the day. Yep. We left early. Uh, didn't didn't we expected. Um, you know, it was a wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. We left earlier than we expected because it was Hurricane Florence that was going to come through Myrtle Beach, and we had we had rode out Hurricane Matthew right. after everybody else had left, and there was just a handful of people left even in our building. Yeah, uh, we rode out uh, Hurricane. We rode Matthew out the hurricane, and it and was tough. We went live quite a few times, but uh, the building was swaying and rocking and, and swaying. And she has and bad vertigo, really so bad vertigo. it was not. It was not comfortable for her. It made it worse. And uh, we were afraid that another hurricane would probably do us in. Right. Um, couldn't do that again. We, we just couldn't do it again. Um, and uh, it was, it was a, I'm glad we did it. Yes. I've never been through a hurricane. I, I never went through a hurricane. That was an experience. I don't recommend it. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do not try this at home. Yes. <laughs> Not safe for work. Not safe. Not safe. Uh, anyhow, we, we uh, honest to God truth, uh, part of the reason we left was not what you would expect. Right. Uh, part of the reason we left was uh, the political climate changed a little bit, as you might know. Uh, there were, uh, there were uh, rallies being held in North Carolina while Trump was running for president, and um, they came back to South Carolina celebrating after going to the rallies, and to each his own. Uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, the beach is sacred. Um, yes. Always has been, always will be. We would like to keep it that way. <laughs> so please, <laughs> no politics on the beach. But that's what happened in Myrtle Beach. It hit the beach hard. Uh, right after the election, uh, people came celebrating, and bless their hearts, they were having a good time. They went to the, the celebration of the rallies, but they brought their celebration to the beach, and it was really difficult. Uncomfortable. Uh, very uncomfortable. The Trump flags hit the beach, the mega hats hit the beach, the Rump flags hit the beach, the Blue Lives Matter flag hit the beach, and um, it just... Too much stress. It was too much stress. So we decided we wanted to go to the most liberal part of America. So we decided another coast. We would go to another coast. We would go back to the West Coast, which we had been planning on coming back to after we finished our work on the East Coast. Right. Anyway, we were coming back to the West Coast. We just moved it up two and a half years early, <laughs> roughly. We actually announced it on uh, New Year's Eve um, that year right. that we were going to be leaving. Uh, when our contract was up the following right. fall. Because we thought we could make it. Yeah. Uh, we we had noticed that we we really didn't want to go through another hurricane. Right. And uh, then with the political climate change, it was another excuse. It was another incentive. incentive. And we decided it was time. Right. And and Janet was born in Astoria, Oregon, anyway. Yes. I mean, that was her home. Yes. Um, that's where she wanted to come back to. Yes. So. Uh, she's a, a West Coast native, and living in the South was very difficult for her. Um, so we were really excited to move back to the West Coast. Right. And uh, we had some friends here, and we were able to get here quick, and uh, it really worked out for us. Yes, it worked out absolutely fabulous. We are so happy here. Yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful place, Seattle. So what we found was, uh, when we first moved here, uh, that... 
Portland is a gorgeous place. It was everything people explained it to be. Uh, it was fun. It was entertaining. Uh, the people there were fantastic. The first thing we noticed when we hit the ground was a lack of judgment. Uh, people do their own thing. They live their own way. They live their own life. And they don't try to interfere with other people. They literally, whatever you're wearing, whatever you're doing, it's cool. Yeah. You know? Freedom. Freedom. Freedom to be an individual. Uh, who you are. Yes. And be celebrated to some degree of that. Yes. Um, so, we, uh, when we started saying that we were going to move to Seattle, yes. which was the original intention anyway. Right. Um, everybody kept saying, but Seattle? It's, it's not as good as Portland. They have to freeze. Seattle and we freeze. Were like, free, Seattle freeze. Seattle, Seattle freeze. freeze. We were like, what? <laughs> but it, it turns out the Seattle freeze is not what people expect. That's yeah. that, what my opinion is on the yeah. Seattle freeze is that people in Portland are more artsy. Yeah, true. They're very artsy. They're very outgoing. True. Uh, they're very inquisitive. People walk up to you on the street when you're doing something. You're doing your business. They just walk up to you on the street and say, who are you? What are you doing? You look free to call. I want to meet you. I want to be friends with you. Let's talk. And and you're like, uh, uh, uh. No freeze there. <laughs> no freeze there. Um, but in Seattle, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, they're not as artistic. They're definitely not as outgoing. They're highly intellectual. I, very intellectual. Very, yes. uh, the whole city is. The whole city has that vibe. Uh, it's a West Coast thing, I guess. Um, but people here are generally a little bit more technical. It's a very technical area because yeah. of the Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Pinterest and Facebook yes. and all these guys here, the big tech companies. They're so it is here. a little bit more technical. Yes. Um, and if you know anything about nerds, uh, we're, not, we're not always very outgoing. No. I am. I am. Janet's not. No. Uh, so not. <laughs> Janet. Janet literally is a total recluse. Yes. Very much so. So a happily a happily, a happily happily reclusive. reclusive uh, yeah. Janet is stepping out of her comfort zone to do this project. Yes, I am. Um, this is not comfortable this for is me. Not normal. <laughs> I'm uh, just trying to make it comfortable for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? This is not normal. But because she is the queen of cruise ship wave and right. editor of cruise brews, we've got to have her. <laughs> so I've pulled her out of her shell enough, and she pulled, she actually, I'm, I'm exaggerating. Literally, Janet pulled me out of my shell. I didn't want to go live. Yes. Um, we needed to go live because we got to get our point across. Yes. And today, things going live are much better uh, than uh, the pre-recorded stuff where you make it all trim and proper. People right. want to hear... Uh, reality. Reality. Real people doing real things. Real screw ups. <laughs> well, you'll see a bunch of those. We'll be going, we'll be going, uh. Yeah. Well, it's live, and live is live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, live is live. You can't fix live. <laughs> live is live. You can't fix it. So, uh, remember, uh, we are still getting back to the Seattle Freeze. We are still part of the Seattle Freeze. We're nerds. Yes. We, we don't understand things. Yes. Um, we want to be friendly. We want to be outgoing. We want to be. We want to be inquisitive and, and learn and meet new people and stuff, but we just don't have the social skills. <laughs> right. At least I don't. So I, I say that the Seattle Freeze is really when people want to be friends, and they really do want to be friendly, but they just don't know how. So if you want to give them a break, make the first step and just start talking to them, and they will talk to you. People in Seattle are very, very friendly. They're very friendly. They really are. They just don't know how to start <laughs> so sometimes you have to just make that first step and for the most part i think a lot of them are in their own little world uh as it is a lot across the country it is very obvious here everybody's looking at their cell phone right they're talking on their cell phone they have their earbuds in they're, they're having conversations as they're strolling through the traffic <laughs> and crossing from corner to corner on the right. red lights or whatever you know it's yeah. a there's a very tech uh, electronic right. community. People are yeah. really tied to their electronics. Right. I, I, I get that. I yeah. am. Yeah. Well, we, we, are. Are. we are. We are. We are. We are. We admit it. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, 
when we got here, we got settled in. We, we came to Seattle. We found out that the freeze was not quite real. <laughs> it was just a, uh, a state of mind. And we started meeting people. We started having a good time. Uh, we started getting out. Uh, and we decided at that point, once we got settled a little bit, we decided we liked it here. And we, wanted to, we actually wanted to find a place. We, yes. we figured we would like it. But we just wanted to make sure. We wanted to make sure. Right. So now that we now that we got settled down, we decided we were going to buy a place to live. Um, and we live tiny. Because we live tiny, we're, we're not only living tiny, we are minimalists. Right. Uh, this is my favorite shirt. I have... He got it from a uh, thrift shop. Woohoo! Most of our clothing is purchased at thrift shops. Thrift shop to We whatever. upcycle. We upcycle, we upcycle everything. Everything. Uh, everything. We try to keep our footprint small. Right. And everything that we have pretty much in this place is, is used. Right. Uh, we've re upcycled everything. Every, whenever possible. And when not possible, Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We're not we're not doing any commercials. We don't you know, we don't no. have any affiliations or anything. No. Well it's actually just, I it's do, practical. But, uh, well yeah we do. Yeah. We do. We have affiliations. Yeah we, we have an affiliate account with Amazon. How, yes, how we cool do. is that? Um, anyhow, uh, we uh, decided we were gonna stay in Seattle and we were gonna stay tiny. We 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 were born this way. Ever since we've been together, we decided we were going to be tiny from this point forward. Right. And from this point forward, everything that we do will be tiny. And tiny means, for us... Under 500 square feet. Under 500 square feet. So anything we, anything we live in, we will always try to be under 500 square feet. And uh, we found out that it was really difficult in Seattle. We expected it would be. We didn't expect it would be this bad. Um, we've always been able to live in condos. Uh, Condos we had were under 300 square feet, uh, okay. 210 square feet, 288 square feet. Here in Seattle, it's 200. Five, or, we're uh, 516 right now. There's two, 517. 517 right now, where we live right now. This was the smallest place we could find here in Bowie. And this is really nice. Uh, it's a bad design. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it has a long hallway in it and uh, a lot of some wasted space. space. I, we could have, with a better design, if we, we could condense it down to less than 300 square square feet and be much more comfortable. Right. Uh, it's just so much wasted space. Um, but we but, love it. Yes, we do. We yeah. absolutely love it. And uh, we uh, decided that uh, we would go ahead and buy. That was the goal. And we were thinking uh, under 500 square feet in Seattle, we were going to find a condo. So it's going to be the sizes that we found since we've been looking. We've been looking just over a year. And the sizes that we found most common in Seattle were 288 square feet. Uh, uh, 320, 3, 4, 420, 500, and a couple, you know, places like that. Every single one of them, $1,000 a square foot. I am not paying 500000 for 500 square feet. I will not do it. That is irresponsible. Yes. Uh, that goes against everything yes. that we believe in. Yes. Um, for the sheer fact that five hundred thousand dollars for five hundred square feet, how how many people could we put how many people in houses for that same amount I'm of money? I'm serious. How many people could live yes. in Seattle with that? Yeah. No, I can't. I can't. I can't justify that. Right. So what we decided to do was, we decided we were just gonna buy land, uh, put a tiny house on it and give the rest out to veterans, homeless veterans, and let them live on the land with us. Uh, right. Veterans or something. We wanted to do something for the community, for other people. People who are homeless, they can't find a place to live. Uh, there are a good percentage of the homeless people, the highest percentage of the homeless people are veterans. Uh, so we could, take out, we could help take out a little chunk of that rather than being Five hundred thousand dollar for five minutes. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, this became an, a new obsession for us because uh, we're going to need help to do it. So we decided it was time for us to start doing all this, these other new projects, and we'll get the message out there and start trying to see if we could solicit some support. And this was how we decided to do it. Yeah. So we have registered. A Couple more domain names. We're we're currently have set up already is in development. Tiny in Seattle, 
Tinyinseattle.com. That's the one we're we're working on right now. That's we're we're on writing right our uh, our live shows from yes. for Tiny in Seattle. Later, maybe we'll do some other stuff, but we've got to do this first. Right. Um, after we get uh, up and running, uh, and we've got another website that we're going to be doing that we'd like to, if we can get some support, um, we'd like to build a tiny house community called Camp Kalakala. Kalakala. Uh, Camp Kalakala. 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 That is the hardest thing to say. That is a really hard thing to say. We've got to get more practice on it. Kalakala. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, Camp Kalakala is, we want to do that because it is the ship, the ferry, that uh, was one of the original uh, beautiful ferries that they first introduced to uh, Art Deco. Art Deco Ferry to match the. Uh, for the World's Trade Fair in Seattle, when the Space Needle went up, uh, that's the ferry that they that they ran, and it was it actually had more visitors to it than the Space Needle. It was actually yeah. a bigger attraction than the Space Needle was yeah. for quite some time. Uh, the ship had some. Uh, it had nine lives, I nine, think. Nine lives. Nine lives, and I wrote an it was a, about it was a it. it was a beautiful beautiful article that you wrote about it, and it had a really good life, and that's why we we chose that ship. Uh, for a name because it it really encompasses the recycling, the upcycling. The upcycling, and it's a uh, uh, maritime. Yeah. So uh, all about cruises. All about cruise, cruises. Cruises. And, and this cruising. is like a silver bullet. It's not like a typical ferry. It's like a big silver bullet, and they are recycling that and uh, offering sections that they preserved to the artist community for them to do artworks with it. And we uh, um, we think it's just fabulous, the whole concept. And to make a camp, uh, like we thought about port, but camp uh, about uh, Kalakala. Right. Would be a, a, a nice addition to Seattle. Right. So the idea is to build our tiny house looking similar to the ferry uh, collector. Right. So either far. either we'll build our uh, our tiny house to look like it. Right. Or um, uh, we could we would like to build a uh, if we have enough money to do it we'd like to build a main in Seattle we're finding out that there may be a, some rules and regulations where you have to have a fixed building in order to have auxiliary dwelling units or tiny houses on the property. ADA. You have to have Right, an ADU, auxiliary dwelling unit. Uh, in order to have an ADU in most neighborhoods in Seattle, we're still working on that information, we'll come back to you on that. Right. Uh, but the requirements may require that you have a fixed house on that property or right. a fixed building on that property. Right. If that's the case, then we'd like to build the Kalakala <laughs> Kala. Kala. um, Ferry as a staging area for the people that come into the camp, the people right. that are moving in, will have a staging area there. Um, and uh, So they'd have quarters right. in our quarters, they'd be divided into uh, sections. And, and that would be a way for them to build their houses, right. to have a place to live while they're building their house, right. and uh, transition into the community. And we'll be helping to build their house, uh, right. because that's what neighbors do. That's what neighbors do, that's what the community does. That's what we that's, do. That's our goal, that's our, that's our intent. Help and others. Exactly, all about uh, a leg up. A leg up. The difference between buying a five hundred thousand dollar piece of land right. or a five hundred thousand dollar piece of property that is super super tiny, right. that only you can live in, yeah. that only you can appreciate, or yeah. doing something for a community. And right. we just decided that it was probably the best for us to do this. Yes. Um, anyhow, uh, the next thing we've got to do is we got to talk about um, we got the condos, we got uh, tiny houses. Now, uh, let me see, what do we got? We need to talk about living tiny in tiny houses, just for a moment. Yes. This is not going to be something that everybody can do. No. Uh, we kind of hinted on it a little bit earlier. Yes. Uh, living tiny requires a certain amount of 
appreciation for the person that you're with. And space. <laughs> and uh, having a good organizational skills uh, is a big plus because everything has to have a place uh, and a place uh, that, that is logical, that works out for you. So you either have to have hooked up with or you should be with a person that picks up behind themselves or yes. that person needs to pick up behind themselves on their own right. because nagging someone to do it is never going to work. No. Uh, but if you don't pick up behind yourself and you don't respect the other person's space right. and the other person's privacy, it could be a problem. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Dua Lipa? Dua, Dua Lipa. Lipa song says, uh, <laughs> Uh, we fight and we argue, but you'll still be love me blind. Uh, and and that's the thing. You have to be able to let stuff roll off your shoulder and get along and, and, and do that because you're in a tight little space. Right. You've got to appreciate the person you live with. Uh, Absolutely. And, uh, and that is, is a really, <laughs> we do. We really do. Um, anyhow. Uh, now that we've uh, decided what we're going to do with that, we're going to do tinies and we're, gonna do, we, we're not going to do a condo, we're not going to do a house. Uh, uh, the challenge is to try to get other people involved. There's a lot of attention being placed on right now in the homeless community to get other people involved in projects of homelessness and stuff like that. Um, Right now in Seattle, there's a lot of attention being placed on homelessness, but there's not much. Uh, in solutions. There's not much in solutions because, unfortunately, what's happened is, uh, a lot of people lump all homeless in the same pile, and they're not the same. Homelessness is a very complicated situation, yes. especially in, well, anywhere in any city, um, it's a very complicated problem. In Seattle, the most visible people that you will see are the people who are addicted. Right. The addictions. The addictions prevent people from having a normal life. Right. You take someone who's addicted and you give them a home and they'll destroy it. Right. Unless yes. they have some support. Yes. They have to you have to address the addiction. And they have to have skin in the game. They have to have skin in the game. Yes. Uh, in order for you to walk away from an addiction, you have to have a desire to do it. Right. You have to make that decision on your own. Right. You can't just grab someone off the street, drop them into a house who is addicted, and let them magically fix their life, because it won't happen. Yeah. Uh, you have to fix the addiction, you have to fix the symptom. If you don't address the symptom, giving them the world will not be the answer, will not be the solution to their problem. Um, you'll only create other problems uh, right. for other people. Uh, so, that said, homelessness is a very complicated issue and it should be addressed uh, within uh, with a focus on the actual problem that caused the homelessness originally. Right. Yes. And we uh, we really wanted to have um, they gotta have skin in the game. Right. If and if they work with us and anybody else that we can get to help us uh, to build their tiny home. Right. They have skin in the game and right. uh, they have a reason to uh, be part of our community. Using the same kind of model that Habitat for Humanity uses. Absolutely. Um, where they call it, uh, they actually call it. Uh, sweat equity. Sweat uh, equity. You have to have your certain amount of sweat equity. Skin in the game. Yes. Uh, because you have the sweat equity in the property uh, that you're that you're going to be taking, uh, then you actually have involvement in the community. Right. And without that involvement in the community, you're not you don't have enough skin in the game. You don't have enough sweat equity. You're not going to appreciate what you got. Right. That's the key. That's the key to making a true uh, tiny community. Yes. Um, that's what we believe the true is. 
uh, once you once everyone has uh, an understanding of what other people had to do, an appreciation for what other people had yes. to do, you saw other people build their house, or you know that they built their house, or they helped build someone else's house. Right. It means something more than just walking in and taking something. Being handed. Being handed a platter. Right. Um, but if we do the, the Habitat for Humanity model, which I, I thoroughly appreciate, I've spent years working with Habitat for Humanity. Jimmy Carter is my hero, my other hero. Martin Luther King is my first hero. Jimmy Carter is my second. <laughs> 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 and if if uh, we can follow those kind of the stuff that he's learned, right? Ro uh, Jimmy Carter and Roslyn, the President Jimmy Carter, the stuff that they did, the way that they learned, uh, the stuff that they've done for the community, and homeless people all over the country. Uh, if we can use that model, I, I think uh, we could do really good. Yes. Uh, That's our plan. It, it really does put community first. Community first. Uh, if we can. Uh, build a main building, the Kalakla, yeah. Kalakla, the Kalakla, the Kalakla, uh, the Kalakla. <laughs> if we can build the building uh, and set it up the way we'd like to do for transition housing, once the community is built, we would like to do uh, Airbnbs for the uh, original tiny rooms that we had for each person transitioning into their house. So the, the Kalakala would actually have three, four, three, three, three or four or five rooms. Three, we don't know exactly. Probably three Airbnb. Probably three. We have one and then three that we would right. Airbnb. And, and, and we would, uh, uh, we'd like to have those set up. And uh, if we can pull that off, uh, then we could Airbnb those rooms out. Right. And uh, bring extra money into the tiny community. Right. Um, that way you could help people with their food or uh, make bills. Even though you'd be in a tiny house, you'll still have some bills. Yes. And there may be some need to help pay people's bills. Right. Uh, if we can do Airbnb out of the original building, then we could bring tourists in and get them to enjoy the tiny community and talk about the tiny community and talk about our mission yes. and spread that yes. out through the country. Then maybe we can get more support for tiny houses and tiny communities and helping people that are homeless that actually need the support um, and if we get really lucky maybe we could expand out into other areas I don't know all I know is uh, you have to have from what I've learned from the Habitat for Humanity in order to have a proper community uh, you can't just grab people who are homeless throw them in a building and say there you go you You've got your new life there. Right. Uh, all it does is create a certain amount of hopelessness because you basically have a project where everyone's exactly the same, a housing project, and if you ever if you know anything about housing projects, they fail miserably. Yeah. If they don't have a mixture of the community. You have to have a diverse population of uh, diverse people. Uh, diverse uh, employment, uh, culture, aspects of life, jobs, everything. As much diversity as possible. Right. The more diversity you have in a community, the more that the community is stronger yes. and those people can share with each other. Yes. If everybody is poor, everybody suffers and starves together. Right. <laughs> so we want to make sure that that's not the case. We don't want to just grab everybody and drop them into a house and walk away. Right. No, it doesn't work. It's a recipe build for disaster. Community. You've got to build the community first. Right. Build the community and then bring people in. You can't help yourself if you're struggling and drowning. Right. If, if you yourself are struggling and drowning, you can't help other people. So once you get back on your feet and you can stand good on your own, then you can help other people. And that's what we've got to remember in the community. Yes. <laughs> It's a, it's kind of a. Yeah, my computer just died. I'll be right. It's kind of a uh, novel uh, approach to uh, uh, social welfare. 
because this is a skin in the game social system. Right. Everybody has to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem. <laughs> right. You gotta be part of the solution first, and then they can be part of the problem, and we'll all have solutions to work through those. We'll all work for solutions for those problems. Right. So, I think we have just about covered everything we need. I need to see the notes, please. Where are we now? Uh, we have covered pretty much okay. everything. We're, I think we're pretty good. Yes, the next step uh, episode will be my cameo. And it's going to be all about what I've been doing for the last 20 years. All about you. And uh, then the cameo after that, the third edition, will be Gary's cameo, where he'll all talk about, about his. Uh, skills and assets that he brings to to our our family right and uh then uh, the third fourth one the third one the right the second the, the, the fourth one thursday we're going to have uh all about cruise ship way all we're going to describe way every network. website what they're about right. why we built them why she built them or why we built them depending on how it worked out right um and literally just explain all of Janet's hard work and all the hard work that we did rebuilding it uh, to make it more automated, and more user friendly and uh, all that. Um, so that we'll, we'll talk about Cruise Ship Wave and then... The fifth one is going to be all about Tiny and from that point forward we're going to be focusing on Tiny. It'll be some of what I did during the day on the network, right. what Gary did during the day Gary drives Uber, Uber, and he comes into contact with lots of people who have those white collar jobs in the tech here, uh, Google and uh, Airbnb. He, he interacts with a lot of people, and uh, he's been sharing our, uh, our what we do and giving positive feedback. So uh, he'll be talking about that, and, uh, and then we'll be going on to what we've done that day right. to try to reach our goal for tiny. Right. Everything's going to be, uh, everything we're doing here is going to be all about trying to become, or trying to get a tiny community, build a tiny community. Yes. What's it going to take? How is it going to happen? We don't know yet. <laughs> it's all a mystery to us and it's going to unravel. But we've got to build the base for everything that we're doing. Uh, so we're doing our, we're, we're going to tell you about ourselves first, then we're going to start our regular uh, broadcasts. And uh, the uh, uh, broadcast is going to be uh, a couple days a week, we believe. At this point, we're going to do it probably two days a week. Right. Uh, we're not sure what days yet. We'll get back to you on that. Um, but uh, we're going to do our first broad our first trial broadcast on Friday. Friday, yes. and that'll kind of give us a good format that we're going to start with. Right. And then from there, uh, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm, I've got everything. Do you have anything else you'd like to talk about? I have nothing else I want to talk about. I was just glad to have this opportunity to sit here and share a bit of our life with you because uh, we're just names otherwise. And, right. And now we're kind of, this week, we're kind of sharing who we are, what we've been doing, where we're going, and uh, why we do this. Right. Why do you do this? Because we love it. That's why we do it. <laughs> we do. <laughs> well, we love you very much. Thank you for spending your time with us. And we'll see you on the website.